Bob Price, I uh, really appreciate you um, taking the time to talk with us. Just to get us started, I wonder if you could summarize the sort of the, the key points of your military career. Uh, sure. Uh, joined the Army in 1967 uh, and then went directly after basic and AI, uh, basic training and advanced training. I went to Vietnam my first tour. Uh, yeah. Adjusted artillery over there, uh, was assigned with an infantry division, infantry unit. Uh, came back, spent about two years stateside, went to flight school, and went back to Vietnam, flew medevac uh, in 1972. Wow. Back to the States, Fort Benning, Georgia, for several years, uh, over to, well, then to Jonestown, 78 time frame, then over to Germany, 80 to 83, and I retired in 1987 uh, out of the Army. As so, a warrant officer? As a CW4, yes. CW4. And um, then last 20 years, I've been uh, running the, working on the flight training program up at uh, Fort Rucker, Alabama, and now I'm fully retired. So you were doing that as a civilian working with the military? Civilian contractor, yes. Civilian contractor. And then before we started recording, you, you said that nowadays you're doing volunteer work. Could you tell us just a little bit about that? Uh, it's just I work with Team Rubicon. They're uh, an yeah. interna international organization. We do disaster relief all over the world. Uh, we work for free. We help veterans, uh, disabled people without insurance. Yeah. Uh, and wow. it's, we're in the Bahamas right now. Well, we're in several places right now. Our biggest event is going on in the Bahamas this week. Is that because the recent hurricane or the storm? Yeah. Correct. We're over there cleaning up. So you're a, you're a Vietnam vet, and I, I talk to Vietnam vets a lot, um, and today our focus isn't, uh, isn't Vietnam, although I'd, I'd love to talk with you. I mean, you did two tours in Vietnam. I do have two, two Vietnam-related questions real quick, though, and then we'll, we'll move on to Jonestown. You, you said you joined the Army in 67, so you volunteered, you weren't drafted? Um, well, there were indications that I was about to be, so okay. I thought I'd be smart and join and try to get what I wanted. Uh, that really didn't turn out the way I wanted it to, but that's okay. Uh, so yes, I did join. Okay, get, you sort of tried to get ahead of Uncle Sam a little bit there. Yeah. Tried to beat that system a little bit. Uh, they told me they had stock control and accounting, and my idea of stock control and accounting as a job was different than the Army's. I was a supply <laughs> clerk in the Army. Uh, that's, what, that's what you were going for? Well, I didn't know that, but yes, that's what I ended up going. And then when I got over to Vietnam, I was with yeah. an artillery unit, and our forward observer element didn't make it through the night. Uh, so... I ended up volunteering to go out there. As a forward observer? Yes, working with the uh, infantry. Yeah, that's, that's tough work at a, at a tough time in the war. And then you, um, then you decided you wanted to fly. Um, just real quick, tell us about that, that transition from infantry to being a helicopter pilot. Well, it wasn't that difficult because the pilots took us out into the swamps and dropped us off, we'd stay out for about 30 days at a time. Yeah. And then they'd come back and pick us up. And mm. they had some humor with the way we smelt when they picked us up. So I, can imagine. I decided it was better going back home every night than staying out in the woods. So when I got back to the States, yeah. got the opportunity to go to flight school, I decided that uh, it would be better since I knew I was going to be going back. It would be better to go as a pilot than it was as a working with the infantry. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so then you, you just last Vietnam related question and then, then we, we will move on. Um, you go back in 72, I'm just wondering um, what your, your major impressions were, how the war was different? Because I mean, 68 is kind of that turning point year. I mean, obviously Tet, Tet Offensive takes place at the end of January 68, it's a turning point. Uh, 672 things are, Seen, I think, are, are pretty obviously winding down. What, what were your impressions? How was the war different between 68 and 72 from your perspective, if at all? Uh, well, I got there during Tet, so it was quite 
eventful. Yeah. Uh, and there were a lot of challenges going on for us, uh, a lot of fighting, but I, I think overall we were still in control. Mm. Uh, I went back in 72 and I volunteered to fly medevac. I uh, went through the training primarily because of all the guys we lost in, in 68. Mm. Uh, but uh, the difference was we didn't own the territory or the air as well as we did in 68. Uh, mm. My latter part of, 60, of 72, uh, I was up in the DMZ area and the folks were coming across the border. And they also had surface-to-air missiles, and they were using them. Wow, wow. That was probably the biggest difference. Yeah, wow. So that 72 period, you were up in the Dongha, Kwangtri, Kantian area up there and along the DMZ? Yes, the medevac unit was uh, in uh, Marble Mountain area. Right, okay. Uh, and then we field sighted Fubai and Kwangtri. Right, so yeah. We were flying uh, along the DMZ quite a bit. Wow. Well, let me jump ahead. So we'll kind of get into Jonestown a little bit, and then we'll back up. But um, So you see combat in 68. I mean, really, I mean, one of, the, one of the most intense moments, if not sort of the most intense moment throughout South Vietnam in 68. You arrive for Tet. Uh, then in 72, you're flying medevacs. So you see a lot of tough stuff in, in two tours in Vietnam. Let's fast, let's fast forward to um, your arrival in, in Jonestown and your first, the first things you, you saw in Jonestown. How would you compare those experiences, if there is any way to compare them, just in kind of the impact they had or, or really go at it any, any way? How would you compare the experiences going into these? these things uh that's tough because in in my first tour we were going out and we lost a lot of people in vietnam as you're fully aware yeah. um, but it was more of a combat situation yeah uh, the jonestown event wasn't a combat situation it was somebody taking full advantage of people that i don't think fully understood uh the predicament that they were in down there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they were, well, some of them voluntarily went, but for the most part, they were just murdered. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, you, you hear that a lot. People say, I, I refuse to use the word mass suicide. It was more of a mass homicide, really. Well, yeah, I mean, some of them uh, went by choice, uh, yeah. but when you start out with the kids and you, you take the older folks down there uh, yeah. and pretty much force them to take uh, the uh, Kool-Aid. Yeah. And then you have people standing around so that nobody can get out of there. You're either going to take it or you're going to, you're going to die. Uh, I mean, they, they even killed the dogs. Uh, they killed everybody. Yeah. I think, I think there was even a, pet monkey that they uh he was a gorilla and they killed him too gorilla did you happen to see that yes saw the cage uh the gorilla was gone when i got there uh, but i did see the cage that he was in that was that was a big big fella wow wow so this is this is awful stuff and you know for that reason i'm i'm all the more grateful that you're willing to talk about it um so, you know, this, this particular story of the military's response, there, you know, stuff has been produced, but I'm not aware of many recorded conversations with folks who are actually there, so I appreciate it. But let's just kind of, you know, we'll, we'll back up. I, I do want to back up and then just kind of walk through things. But when you think about your, your first impressions when you, when you first arrived there, what's the first stuff, what are the first images that, that you see? Um, two. One's not an image so much. Uh, the colors, the different colors. We we first went in with, uh, I think we had four aircraft, and of course the, 
the traveling over there, we don't we don't have the we didn't have the GPS like they have today. So everything is pretty much time, distance, and heading. And if you get winds, it takes you off course. And it was quite a ways over there. Um, so we went across a place called Matthews Ridge, which is a few miles west uh, of Jonestown. Did a low pass there and didn't see a whole lot and figured that was not it. So we took the road down. We knew the road would lead to Jonestown. So we flew along the ridge line along that road and then we passed over the site and you could see all the different colors on the ground. Uh, didn't know what it was at first, um, but it just, there was a bunch of color and then uh, the smell. When we got over top, we were about 500 feet and it was absolutely no doubt what it was. So was it the smell first and then you realized what the colors were? Oh yeah. Wow. Yes. And of course, then we were on short final and you could see the bodies. Now we were briefed that this might, might be a hostile environment. So uh, we were a little bit cautious about, about going in. Uh, however, um, while we turned on final, we couldn't see a whole lot of movement. Uh, yeah. Couldn't see much of any movement. All we could see is just uh, some bodies stacked up. Wow. Did, did you have, um, since when you're going in, you don't know whether this might turn into a sort of a, a mini combat situation. Um, did you have door gunners on the Hueys ready to go just in case? No, we're medevac. Uh, we use self-defense, but uh, we are not prepared to start shooting at people. Now, I will tell you that when we got on final approach, uh, I could see some people in the wood line and they were in uh, fatigues, jungle fatigues. And as I got closer, uh, I actually recognized a couple of the guys, they were rangers that I had worked with before. And uh, at that point I made a call and said that area was secure because there's, when my rangers are on the ground, there's no doubt it's secure. Right, wow. When you're flying into Jonestown and you don't know, I mean, um, because obviously, I mean, you know that, um, I'm sure you know Congressman Ryan has been shot, a number of other people have been shot and killed on the airstrip. So, you know, obviously people down there had guns. You're flying in, you don't know if you're heading into a, a, a gunfight. Um, this may seem like a, a dumb question, but um, did you feel yourself in some way kind of going back into Vietnam mode just for at least a couple a couple minutes when in that time of uncertainty yeah I, I don't know what you think when I was in Vietnam I was uh, pretty much bulletproof in my own perception uh, that didn't work out so well but hmm. uh, into Jonestown I think we're just concentrating on our mission and that's to help anybody we can find it's uh, initially more search and rescue than anything else uh, with the possibility of there being some contact because uh, we knew obviously that shots had been fired uh, yeah. but again when I saw the Rangers there no I had no no problem at all going in that place yeah so you land the helo and how many did you have on the helo uh, how many personnel? Yeah. We had two pilots, a pilot in command and a co-pilot, and we had a crew chief and a medic on each aircraft. So, you know, you, you land the helo, and what's the, what's the first thing you do? What's Wave the first thing ranger. that your crew does? What's that? Wave my ranger buddies over there in the wood line, and they came walking out, and we got out and talked to them okay. uh, just to see what the status of the area was. And what did they say? Secured. They had been in there. I think they got in the day before we did, uh, yeah. maybe sooner. Uh, but they pretty much had Jonestown, the LZ, secure. Uh, yeah. As to the surrounding area, we still didn't know what was going on. Yeah. They Did they tell you... Um, you know, you've got, you, you mentioned all the colors, which of course are the bodies. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing one of the things you're told right off the bat is 
basically no survivors. Now, we still at that time thought people had escaped into the woods. Uh, really? there, there was talk in the camp, of course we shut down and we got to talking to some folks. There was talk in the camp that there were escape routes uh, that people were going to utilize. So there was some obvious unrest in the, in the area. Yeah. Uh, and we ended up, as a matter of fact, one day somebody got me a bullhorn and we flew over some uh, routes that we thought from the air looked like people would use and just talked on it and saying, you know, we were uh, from the U.S. Army and uh, come on back, everything's secure and it's all over. Wow. Uh, but we never, we never found anybody. How, did you keep that up for a day or two or did you give that up pretty soon? That was gone pretty quickly when we realized that the people were not just laying on the ground, that they were stacked on the ground. Uh, they were three and four people deep. Wow. Wow. And pretty much as if you followed it, I think the paper said, and obviously I was there, I was not home. Uh, the, the numbers uh, of estimated deaths were increasing daily. And it was because they were realizing, you know, your first visual is from the air. You're looking at a couple hundred people. And uh, when you start walking through them, you start seeing three and four deep. Um, big difference. Numbers go up. Wow. So um, you you mentioned a, a few minutes ago that you know you're in you're in work mode. You know you've got a mission and you, you do the mission. Um, and I hear that from vets all the time. You know, mostly you know we're talking about combat situations. This will probably resonate with you. You know, the guy will say, "Well, we were, you know, we were on patrol and then an ambush or something like that." And and uh, I used to ask. And then, you know, what did you think when that first bullet was by? But I don't ask anymore because the answer is pretty much always nothing. It's just the, the training. Yeah, the training goes in, the training kicks in, and, and you're just grateful for the training after the fact, though you, you just respond. Um, was there a point at Jonestown when the, you know, when it did sort of morph from a mission into a human event, like, you know, when the, just the magnitude of this, of what you were experiencing, sort of strike you, if that, make, if that question makes sense? It does. Uh, the first time you get out of the aircraft and we walked down, uh, they had a little boardwalk everywhere throughout the place because the rainy season was bad and you couldn't walk around without getting up mud all over the place. So they had little boardwalks. And yeah. the first time I walked down, uh, heading down towards uh, uh, the temple area itself, uh, when you start seeing the numbers of bodies that are stacked, the numbers of bodies, even if they weren't stacked, uh, yeah, that grabs you real quick. The kids especially? Well, yeah, the kids and, and the families. Mm. Uh, you know, you'd see moms with their arms around uh, the babies laying face down. Uh, so yeah, that'll, that'll tighten you up real quick. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, as you're talking, I've got these images in my, in my mind, you, well, know, you, you see the photos. Yeah. And you try to make sense of it at that point too. And there is no making sense of it. Uh, it's yeah. just, you know, how do you evaluate this situation? I flew medevac in the States for most of my military career, our job was a real time uh, event in that it was the same thing as I did in combat. We picked up roadside, we picked up uh, paratroopers that were injured at Fort Benning, uh, we picked up a lot of premature babies, so it was always mission and uh, uh, you were in there to, to help out on this one. Uh, it was just, we got there, we're ready to go, we're ready to evacuate people, uh, but there's just nothing there. There's no one to evacuate. It didn't make sense. Wow. So you're there about, is a, the event itself is November 18th, you're there about the 22nd, something like that, November 22? That would be about right. They alerted us. Yeah. I was uh, actually, 
a side note, I was in Atlanta with my wife and my five months old son. Uh, he was about seven months old at that time. Yeah. Uh, he had cancer and we were at Emory University. Yeah. And getting chemo and driving back when I got the call that said, uh, come on in. They couldn't tell me what it was about, but they could tell me to come on in. And uh, we went in, uh, got briefed, started gearing up. Uh, we had some helicopter dismantling challenges because they weren't sure of the aircraft, uh, but they finally got that squared away. We you mean were having to basically take the helo apart, take the rotors off to fit them on the plane to get them down there. Correct. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, we, we were all had our go bags. We were sitting in a hangar all night. Uh, and then I think it was the following day. So yeah, it was, it was a couple days. Yeah. Uh, and then we, of course we got to Jonestown and had to put everything back together and had to test fly them. And, uh, then we took yeah. off. Now they, um, so the bodies still weren't being moved by the time you got there. They, they were still where they were when they, when they died. They were still there. Wow. Just as they had been, uh, the heat was, uh, heat and humidity does amazing things to the human body, uh, and it was bad. I'll bet, in terms of just the bloating and things that you hear about. Didn't know if you wanted to go over that on the tape, but yes. That yeah. was mm, it's just more. A, you, you, you said that, was it your son you said was in the hospital with cancer at that time? Yeah, he had a neuroblastoma. They peeled it all out. That was... We found it, my wife found it, actually. I had a cold, took him in at five months old, and he's now, I think, 40. Wow. And he's retired from the Army. So that all went well. So one thing I'm wondering is, you know, you're, you're at the hospital with your five-month-old son who has cancer, and all of the, I mean, I can't imagine any of this stuff, you know, what it's like to be in combat in Vietnam, what it's like to be in Jonestown, what it's like to be in that situation. But here you are in this situation, obviously very concerned and, and worried about your son. I, I'm wondering if, um, I don't really know, know how to phrase this, but I've got, here are the two images that I have in my mind, and I'm just wondering if, if you have a response. So one image is you're in the hospital, concerned about your son, wanting him to live, and then you're in Jonestown, and you see moms with their arms around they're five month olds dead. Um, I don't know if, if there even is a response to that, um, but I'm just wondering what comes to your mind. That's what makes you go. I mean, the opportunity to be able to help them down there yeah. is what it's all about. We, at the time we left, we thought there were people down there alive. Uh, so our job was to get it out. I mean, I got the best wife in the world, the best hospital, Emory University. Uh, they're going to take care of things at home. That's where a lot of spouses, I don't think, get credit in the military. Yeah. They've got huge challenges, but they take care of that. And I guess we go out and try to save the world, and sometimes we just can't do it. Yeah. Had you ever heard of Jonestown before November Never. 1978? Never. Were you, now you're, I'm sure, pretty preoccupied with your son. Did, had you even heard the news? Uh, no, I uh, had not heard it at all. I got a phone call from a friend of mine telling me I needed to get back because we were a, a reactionary force. We were a strip alert type unit uh, to move out. So yeah. it was just a call saying, get back, we're going. And I did not know until I got back from Atlanta where we were going. Well, and you hadn't, even by that point, hadn't heard of Jonestown. The news hadn't got to you. You're preoccupied with your son. Boy, that's something. So you fly from, you fly from the base in Georgia uh, straight to Georgetown? Uh, Timory International. I think it's in Georgetown, yes. Okay. And then you reassemble the helos and then from there to Jonestown. Correct. And how, how long are you in Jonestown altogether? Uh, you know, I don't remember, three days, four days, something like that. But I spent all day there. Uh, we flew in in the morning, and uh, uh, last light we flew back. We had to be back by uh, uh, just at dusk because 
flight rules changed in Guinea's airspace due to uh, no radar, no nothing. So you had to be on an instrument flight plan and wow. it wasn't going to work where we were working. <laughs> yeah. So you, and then in, in Georgetown, where did you stay? Uh, we had tents on the airfield. So you set up uh, tents there. Yeah, GP medium, GP large. Yeah. Uh, we, were, we were co-located. There were several units there. Yeah. Uh, some Air Force um, and some other Army units. Yeah. Uh, we, were, we were located with them. Yeah. So three, three days, um, maybe three, day, three days in Jonestown. By the end of that third day, had they started moving the bodies or were the bodies still? We were putting them in body bags. Oh, oh so you were part of that, putting them in body bags. Yeah, when we found out, the first day we flew and tried to find people. Uh, and then uh, we were taking bodies back. Uh, we rigged the aircraft to haul three litters. Uh, and we had to put one body bag per litter. And at that rate, uh, we wouldn't have finished up in, in quite a while. Yeah, uh, in in Vietnam, and it's a different way to look at it. But it, we'd go in and pick up people. I picked up as many as fifteen people. Uh, you just put them on and get out of the the right. combat area. Yeah, not a pretty sight, but you're getting them back to medical care. Right, and hopefully getting them fixed up. Whereas in right. Jonestown, uh, the urgency wasn't there, but uh, you couldn't you just can't stack people in like that. It didn't work. So they transferred the pickup over to the Jolly Greens that could hold more uh, personnel. So what we did yeah. is we started filling body bags and then we'd haul them up. I don't know if you've seen the picture of the landing zone we used there, but we started hauling them up there and just putting them in a line and then they'd come in and we'd put them on the aircraft. Was that the same landing zone where the congressman was shot? No, no. Oh, no, he, he was down at the airfield. We were right in Jonestown. You were in Jonestown. Right. Did you, now I'm guessing as a warrant officer, were you actually hands-on? You're actually, you know, participating in the, the body removal, or are you primarily in a supervisory role? No, I was putting them in there. You were in there? Yeah, it was, it was not a good situation, and uh, uh, if you have your crew doing it, you're going to do it too. You're going to help mm -hmm. them. Did you have any of your enlisted guys who after a while just said, I, you know, enough, I, I can't do this anymore? Or did everybody hang in there for them? They, they were mission. Uh, they, they were on mission. I mean, uh, did we feel bad? Did we want to stop? Did, uh, yeah, we, we did, but okay. you, can't, you can't walk away. You're there. Uh, you're invested in it. You're going to help as, as best you can to get those people back. Yeah. For their um, the evenings back in Georgetown, you know, again, I'm, I'm relating this to, you know, since I've, I've spoken to so many combat veterans, so that's really the only other thing I'm, 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 you know, that's what I can kind of bounce off of. I know this is a different situation, but often combat vets, you know, I'll say, well, you know, after the, after the, the combat, you know, after a firefight or something like that, you know, what kind of stuff do you talk about? And, and often what I get is, you know, you know, I mean, sometimes we'll swap stories of the firefight, but, but a lot of times we're just not talking about that. Or we're talking about other stuff. Um, when you're back in Georgetown in the evening, obviously it's a long time ago. It's more than 40 years ago. But do you have any recollection of the, the kind of stuff that you talked about or that the, the enlisted guys talked about? I mean, were you trying to process this, or were you just kind of saying, look, that's our day job, it's evening now, let's talk about other stuff? Uh, well, number one, there, there probably wasn't a partition officer enlisted. Uh, we worked together, so uh, we talked together, and, you know, back in the States, we, we worked together, we played together. Down there, uh, when we landed, it was get the aircraft ready for the next day, and we helped out. Yeah. Uh, we all helped. Uh, cleaning it up was challenging uh, because of hauling bodies and stuff. So uh, there was a lot of work to be done. 
when we got into the uh, tent area, it was pretty much eat dinner, uh, try to find a place to get a shower, and, and that's it. There wasn't, I don't recall any discussion uh, yeah. about the day. Uh, we did debrief to the fact uh, to figure out what we had accomplished for the day and what we were going to do the next day. Yeah. Uh, of, course, of course, it was a command briefing uh, yeah. The, yeah. to give the target area for the next day. But my, uh, myself and I want to say pretty much all the crews uh, returned uh, to Jonestown every morning and we left every evening. Uh, yeah, I imagine with the heat and the humidity and the, the heavy the heavy work, everybody was probably pretty wiped out by the end of the day. Correct. And, and both mentally and physically, uh, working yeah. around that stuff is debilitating. It, it, it's rough. In your own case, how, how long, you know, we, let's come back stateside. Um, how long did it take you before you kind of got back into your stride again? after experiencing what you experienced in Jonestown? Was it immediate? Was it something like just, you know, what's the next mission or? Um, okay, I'm glad you added that last part because I don't know if I've ever gotten over it. I don't know if anybody ever could. Yeah. Um, but as to next day, next mission, yeah. You're on the roster, you're going to go fly medevac, uh, but are you going to, is that going to go away from you? No. No, that was, uh, that's something that will never go away. Uh, add that to the body, the smell. Add that to the masks that we had to wear walking around in there. Uh, you'll never get me in one of those masks with wintergreen on it. Now, we wear those masks in my Team Rubicon work, but they don't have that, I think it was wintergreen, but whatever that smell was, if I ever get near it, I'm gone. I cannot. Cannot really? stay. Yeah. You'll never forget that. When you've done this relief work and you've seen, you know, situations, uh, you know, post-disaster situations, have you ever, talking with the guys, brought up your Jonestown experience? No. I, my brother, I've talked to him. He knows uh, about it. He was military also. Uh, as a matter of fact, he was in, he was the commander of Camp Davies in Panama during this time. But, uh, wow. no, it's, it's not a subject that I would bring up. A couple of people know that I was there and once in a while it'll come up in a conversation, but now it's not something I talk about. Actually, this is the first time, uh, well, was, yeah. And for that reason, I, I, I appreciate it all the more. Um, since that event, have you had any interest in it? Have you watched any documentaries? Have you read any biographies of Jim Jones? Have you, you know, because again, I'm, I'm relating it to the combat vets. A lot of, I, I've heard a number of combat vets who say, I really had no idea what I was part of until I, I started reading books 40 years later. And then I realized what this operation was about or something. Have, I, have you had a post Jonestown interest in the topic? Yes, I've read probably everything I could, and I've probably seen all the movies uh, because that's actually correct. We had no idea of the gravity of that situation. Uh, not even knowing the senator was there. I, I'm in Fort Benning, Georgia. I don't know senators from California, things of that nature. It just wasn't on my radar at all. Uh, but, yeah, uh, since that time, uh, I've seen it. Uh, I'm not real good with the movies of it, but uh, I've, I've read a lot of literature. And my wife uh, kept several magazines from that time frame and newspaper paper articles, uh, and I've obviously looked at those. Yeah. It, it must be. I mean, it must be. I don't know what the right word is. Um, I, I don't know what the right word is. I mean, it must be, for lack of a better word, amazing to read this stuff to see the documentaries and to, you know, realize that you were one of the small number of people who was actually there. Well, and to know the end before the beginning. I mean, mm. you can see how charismatic that guy was. Uh, if it, if it proves anything, uh, trust, but verify, uh, mm. know what you're getting into because we know what the end result was now when you're reading it. 
and yeah. obviously hindsight's very good. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's 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 an unusual position. It's something. Well, and as I said to another veteran, Clarence Cooper, who who you know, um, yes. I mean to have participated in the Tet Offensive and Jonestown. I mean that's a ten year period. You know, it just proves what I've heard before and what I mentioned to Mr. Cooper. You know, if if you're in the military, you have a pretty good chance of participating in history, not just watching it on the not just watching it on the news. Just a, a few a few more questions, and then we'll we'll wrap it up. Um, there are there are images that that we get from Jonestown, the pavilion. You must have seen the pavilion, right, where the meetings took place. Yes. Yes. And, they had a band stand up there too, with a drummer, stuff like that. On, drum set on the stage. Yeah, yeah. Is that where the sign was? Those who don't know the pastor, you saw that. Yep. As a matter of fact, I got a picture of that somewhere here. Uh, but yes, we we saw that. The vat was not far from that area. The vat. All the syringes and everything were there. Yeah, and. Now there's that there's that famous cover on Time magazine that shows the vat, the walkway. I think it's I think the perspective is going out out of the pavilion. I'm not sure what the perspective is, but anyway, you've got the walkway that connects to the pavilion. You've got the vat there, and then behind that, you can see the syringes and so on. You saw the vat as well. Oh yeah, we yeah, uh, standing right beside it, and there was uh, several families within just a few feet of it laying face down. And that's where I was talking about, uh, I think she had on a pinkish dress. And that's just one that sticks out in my mind because she was the one that had the child on one side, uh, maybe on both sides, but, and underneath them, there were more people. So yeah, it was right there. Just, just one vat. One vat is all I saw. That to me, I mean, that's that's the one thing I really I really focus on. You know, you've got nine hundred people. Uh, take out take out the kids. You've got several several hundred people, mm -hmm. and it only takes one leg to kick that thing over to slow everything down. That's the that's the thing I really that's maybe this whole disaster. That's the thing that's most incomprehensible to me. Well, Jones was. A, well, I hate to say charismatic, but he, people listened. He talked and people listened and they believed. You, you got to understand, I walked through that place and they had no television. So there was really no connection to the outside world. He controlled all of that. How did he control it and what did he do? They had VCR players, if you remember those. Yeah, uh, yeah. But the tapes they had were of police shows, detective shows. Chips was a, a big one that I saw down there. Really? What are they? Well, today we laugh at Chips when we look at it, but it shows the police shooting, beating people. And that's what he ingrained in those people. I believe that to this day. That's all they got to see every day, how bad the United States was, how bad the government was, how badly they treat people on a daily basis, and uh, they, he just had them brainwashed, I believe. Now, there were some that didn't like the idea, but they didn't get too far either. Uh, like I said, the, uh, the elder people, I think they brought them in first. Mm. Uh, you know, if they're wheelchair bound or something like that, but, uh, uh, and they pretty much killed them, but anybody that was going to go out, uh, they were going to either be shot uh, there were also bow and arrows there, so yeah, they were gonna, they were not gonna make it out. Really, you saw bows and arrows there too. Yes. You see the loudspeakers. Uh, the loudspeakers there. The whole stand was there. Yes. Kind of like North Korea, where the messages are just being continuously. You know. They had. He could talk throughout the area, and everybody would hear him. He, he had a. a the only outside communication they had was uh, ham radio and yeah. that too, but that loudspeaker system uh, was located 
the actual system was located in the same building and he could talk to everybody in the camp and he did every night. Wow. Say, compared to say a, a football field, uh, how, how, how big would you say the whole Jonestown thing was? Like maybe the equivalent of three football fields or something like that? No, it's bigger than that. Bigger. Uh, yeah. Um, it, it's, it's bigger than that because, I mean, they had a lumber mill there. They had a, a brick making plant there uh, because they were, they were totally self-sufficient. I mean, it's amazing what he did. Uh, and then the gardens, you're talking about five acres. Really? Uh, yeah, oh. that was cleared. Now, the houses were kind of close in, uh, and that's another story in itself. But, yeah, they, uh, uh, yeah I would say about five acres. So it's this weird, it's this weird almost contradiction of uh, people who are clearly very industrious, right? They've created something livable in the middle of this, you know, jungle, the heat and the humidity are tremendous, the, the rains, rainy season, et cetera. So you've got a very industrious people, right, who are, but yet their leader is this drug-addled, the guy who's clearly lost it and who leads them all into disaster. It's just, it's impossible to understand really. And believes a hundred percent of what he's saying. He believes it. Uh, and I guess when you get impressed upon you every day and every night, uh, you're going to believe it too. Yeah. His, his inner circle believed it. Uh, and if you didn't believe it, I think you would have had a problem. So I, I know I saw some letters, um, saw some letters. Oh yeah, I know people, uh, both incoming and outgoing, uh, that didn't make it out. Uh, there were some disgruntled people there that just wanted out, uh, which I think provoked or evoked the uh, response from Ryan. Yeah. So um, you saw, like, you know, um, there, there are, at, there are two letters I know of that folks wrote right at the very end. One of them actually from a young woman who's in Jones's inner circle. You, 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 saw, you saw what may have been those letters? Uh, I didn't, don't think I saw that one, but I probably saw 10 or 20 of them. Uh, they were just laying around like on a table or something like that? Yeah. And from what you could tell, had they been left there purposely? Like, you know, I, I want somebody to come find this? No, uh, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, I mean, the whole place was kind of tore up, uh, went into most all of the, uh, for a better term, hooches that they had, and uh, there was stuff strewn about, um, but there were letters, and I actually have a couple of them, that uh, uh, were rough reading. Uh, you could tell, and again, this is hindsight, you could tell people, uh, we're starting to see through this, and I think his world was coming apart, uh, not only from Ryan, but I think it was coming apart from within. Now, why didn't they push over the vat? I got no clue. But I know he was sitting right beside it up on his little throne there in the uh, uh, in front of the bandstand. And you saw his throne. It, yeah, I saw that, saw him. Yeah. You saw Jones. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, actually, some people had asked me right after I got back. They said there's a rumor he is not dead. I can tell you he is. Um, a buddy of mine hauled him out. Okay. Aside from that, aside from the buddy hauling them out, is there, I mean, we know that Jones is dead, but in, in that moment when someone said, well, there's a rumor he's not dead, and you said, no, I know he is. Um, what, what, what was behind that? your response uh, because, what you saw. because I think every day we see things where people are are rumoring uh, instead of telling facts people yeah. try to tell the truth all the time but sometimes you know maybe it's to get a story I don't know what it is yeah yeah but for a fact I knew Jones was gone it's and I think well, I'll just say that I knew he was gone. Yeah, is is that? Um, I don't want to press this 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 too much. Um, I think the word is, you know, obviously, 
pretty much everybody goes out with the with the flavor aid or whatever it was in that in that concoction. But Jones himself was shot right in the temple, and you saw that. Um, potentially dumb question: Did he have his dark sunglasses on still? No, I think they were there, but I no, I can't I'm, I can't say okay. they, he did not have them on. No, his eyes were wide open. Oh gosh! And he didn't take the Kool Aid; he had everybody else take. Yeah. I'm not I'm not speechless often, but I'm I'm almost I'm almost there now. I mean, it's um. Oh, there's, you know, think about Jonestown itself. Ask people if they ever found a cemetery. A the cemetery at Jonestown for those who died. Yeah, because people die. Uh, they had a brick factory, but I never saw a cemetery. It's an interesting question I, I because I believe, I may be wrong about this, but I believe that Jim Jones's own mother died there um, before... The event but I don't know I don't know but well, I didn't see a cemetery so I, I I'd find it hard to figure out how many people actually went through that place uh, Wow that's interesting and, but I, and I will also say they had that furnace but their ability to construct the people there was amazing I mean what they did clearing and building it was, uh, they were really skilled. They were dedicated to what they were doing to end up like that. Just which, which makes the end all the more pathetic, huh? Yes. To see that industry and that intelligence and that community mindedness going out that way. Last, last question. I, I do want to, I, I want to let you go. Uh, trampling on your time. I really appreciate that you're taking this time. Um, a little while ago, you mentioned the housing and you, and you said that the housing was sort of a, a whole story by itself. What, what, what comes to mind when you think of the housing? It's sort of the bungalows, use the word hooches, but kind of these little bungalows lined up. Huh? Correct. What, what comes to mind when you, when you think about that? Numbers. Uh, the beds, they were stacked individual beds and they had numbers on them. I don't think they recognized people as individuals. Uh, I think it was a way to keep track of people, especially the children, because they weren't staying with their parents. They were staying in those bungalows. Um, and I, the communist ideal of, you know, well, he, had those, yeah. he had those books in his building. Uh, communist Manifesto, all that stuff was on his little bookshelf in his room. You saw that? Yeah. You, yeah. you saw his, his, his library in his, his bungalow. I don't know if I'd call it a library, but I was in there and I saw his books and stuff, yeah. Communist Manifesto? Yeah, he had several of them, uh, all slanting uh, in that direction. No uh, no Bible, I'm guessing? Not that I saw. I think the it pastor... Could have, it could have been there, but I surely didn't see it. Well, a survivor tells me that um, they would take Bibles away from people. And mm -hmm. I would believe that. Uh, the Bible in my beliefs, wouldn't have stood out as much as the Communist Manifesto and all those, because I assume everybody has a Bible. So I, it just, that would seem ordinary. There was nothing ordinary about this guy. But anyhow, on the, on the bungalows, yeah, the, I, I think it was to divide families because a family unit, I think, would be more willing to shed themselves of, of that arena uh, so if you divide that family up, uh, divide people up, then they don't have the ability, uh, easily have the ability to formulate some kind of plan to get out. Which may help to explain, you know, how the end was possible. And, you know, Marx writes about that in the Communist Manifesto, one of the goals being the, effectively the elimination of the family. Yes. Um, well, this is the, the last question that, that comes to my mind. Um, and 
It's a real general question. Just put yourself in, in front of a, a group. Let's say, you know, here where I teach, I, I teach on Jonestown fairly regularly. At, every other year, at least, we, we spend a few class sessions on it. Depends on what the topic is, what the, the course topic is. Um, let's just say I have you in front of my students, and the simple question is, what do you think what do you think young people should know about Jonestown or about some theme related to it? What, what, what do you think? When you hear something, make sure you fully understand what you're involving yourself in. Um, the best answer is, is not always the one that seems to give you everything. Mm. Uh, these people were promised a lot. And that's easy to follow. Uh, try working hard and maintain Army term situational awareness uh, because everybody's not there to give you everything. Mm. Uh, sometimes you just got to get up on your own and go. In hindsight, we can see what Jones was doing. But if you're sitting there and you're listening to somebody standing in front of you promising you the world, you better look out. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's a very dark world that they're going to give you. Yeah. That's right. And again, this is all just my opinion. But uh, no, I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. I mean, you know, there, there, there were probably um, there must have been some dark people. Well, obviously there were dark people in that movement, but I don't think I don't think I think most of the people who went to Jonestown really thought they were working to create something beautiful. They absolutely did. They were promised something beautiful. They were working towards it, and they worked hard. And they had, I mean, obviously, if it wasn't for the bodies, it was really a neat place. It was well laid out. It was well constructed. Uh, and then it all went to hell. Those people absolutely believed that there was going to be, and he spoke a lot about it, a nuclear war, and they were going to be safe down there, and they had everything. Uh, and they did until, until they didn't. Until they didn't, yeah. Well, Mr. But, Price, well, I'm, I'm like sorry. I said, you, the people, I mean, you can read the letters. They are, uh, God, so sincere. Uh, just good people. And to have it end like that, that's just wrong in so many ways. Wow. Well, Mr. Price, I really appreciate you, uh, your willingness to, to, to share. We've, we've heard a lot from uh, survivors. We've heard a lot from other folks associated with the People's Temple. That's important, and and um, I hope you know we continue to to hear from them. To my knowledge, we haven't heard a lot from the military veterans who participated, who who proved Jones wrong, but unfortunately too late. Jones is telling these people the American government's the enemy. Actually, it's the American government that came in that wanted to save these people, yes. um, but you weren't able to get there in time. So and bring them out with dignity, which we could do. You could bring out the bodies with dignity, as you were saying. We're gonna, you know, we're not. It's we're gonna stack them or bring them into the helos as whatever the right word is, as, with as much dignity as possible. With respect. With respect, yeah. So I really appreciate you taking the time, and um, I hope this conversation will encourage others uh, who participated either there on the ground in Jonestown or at Dover where the bodies go, you know, the bodies end up going to Dover Air Force Base mm -hmm. or to other, other folks involved, uh, directly or indirectly. I hope that it encourages them to, to share their memories as well. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. You bet. Thank you. All right.